Hello, we are live. Welcome on the masterclass. Uh, today I'm going to host again uh, Andreas. Hi, Andreas. Hi, Chris. Thank you for inviting me again. Uh, just uh, just to briefly, we are here. We are starting uh, exactly at I 8 p.m. Uh, Central European Summer Time. Uh, just three minutes uh, left. But if you can uh, talk. Tell on the chat if you can hear us well and see us and see the video of two of us. So we will really appreciate. So, so just write on the on the chat if everything is all right. There's already many people live. So hello everyone. Let me see. I see already Pavel. Hi Pavel. Hi Ashik. Video and audio works well. Yes, this is what I wanted to uh, to hear. Uh, let me see. Uh, so yeah, so I'm uh, I'm speaking to you from Oslo and you, Andres, uh, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee. So it's not usual uh, hour for. Learn Grasshopper webinars. Usually, we are making in the working hours in the in Europe, uh, but this time we will try a little bit uh, later than usual, and we'll see. Uh, there's many people register. Uh, there's o o over uh, 600 that register, so we are really happy that so many are interested in this wall throw. Uh, and yeah. Probably most of you are bridge uh, bridge engineers because today we are going to show you the best, in our opinion, uh, workflow for designing the uh, the bridges. Uh, so yeah, we have Bruno, we have Moshen, we have Przemysław, Paulina. Nice to good to having you here. Uh, if you can just uh, write uh, where you. Uh, where are you watching this uh, webinar? Uh, I know that maybe if we are uh, watching, if we use this webinar in this hour, maybe some from Australia, there is a morning. Uh, but we hope that will be many people from uh, US because actually Andres is working in the uh, United States and most probably uh, we hope so that many people from United States, Canada will be there. We have Finland, India, Portugal, hmm, India. It needs to be. It has to be uh, really night there, late at night. <laughs> okay, uh, there is already one minute left. Just we will wait. Egypt, Dani, Lima, Peru, India, Germany. And next time I will I will prepare the map where the people are are watching us because it's really amazing that so many people from the whole the country from the all the countries in the world are are watching and actually uh, watching us uh, showing some stuff in grasshopper this is really this is really amazing all right let me see so uh, just one small remind reminder as always we are live on the several platforms. I see that many people are watching on LinkedIn because we are live on LinkedIn. Uh, so please give us a like uh, on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook. It's for sure it will grab attention more people. So maybe more people uh, will join. And maybe for not this session, for uh, the second session that it will be today. Uh, because we have two day sessions, uh, two master classes. Uh, together with Andres, we've decided that we are going to conduct this free session too, uh, and we are going to show the whole workflow. Uh, we are going to start from the empty canvas, almost empty canvas, and we will show you how we can design the uh, the bridge uh, structure. So we have 8 p.m. in Oslo, so let's start. Uh, so today webinar, it will be two hours. We'll try to uh be between something uh this uh this time slot um every uh, we're going to divide our sessions uh first it will be andres uh, who will show the grasshopper workflow how you can create the whole geometry of the bridge with the foundation columns and uh, bridge deck just with the components from sophistic uh, link in grasshopper and after his session, after first hour, 
uh, we will going to have Q and A where you can ask questions. But if you will have any questions during the uh, his session, so please going on the chat. I will going to kindly interrupt Andres uh, and to ask some question about the workflow. If you have your Sophistic and Grasshopper already installed, so you can follow uh, this all the uh, what he, what Andres is doing. But everyone will get uh, will get this recording and will get also Grasshopper files. So I will advise that to just follow the workflow and to be um to get no better components and the workflow how to work best and maybe afterwards after this webinar you will get the recording with the all uh, final scripts so it will be easier than just following in this live webinar be because we are not going to wait until the uh, others will finish um so if you haven't registered yes uh, so please uh, scan this qr code or go to learngrasshopper.com slash masterclasses sophistic tecla or uh, slash uh, webinars uh, so you can still register your email and you will get uh, the recordings from today and tomorrow sessions tomorrow uh, tomorrow uh, with the email that you will register so as I said, I as already seen some question about that. This uh, will be uh, a session will be recorded and will be available uh, on the uh, YouTube. But afterwards, uh, it will be just a, a private uh, video. So please register your email if you want to have uh, access to this video. Um, because I already see some question from Bruno. Uh, have registered, but watching from YouTube. Any advantage from registering, like files to download? Yes, uh, there will be files, hold the workflow from my side um, about Tecla and Andres. So you will get uh, the day after tomorrow, you will get on your uh, email if you register. So this is the uh, huge advantage. And of course, recordings if you cannot uh, participate live. Okay. So if you will uh, register, uh, register your email. Uh, so here we start today's uh, session. So we have uh, these uh, three points. First, it will be introduction to this masterclass, a little bit about the project. And then it will be Andres who will um, create the whole geometry in uh, Grasshopper. And then uh, I will take this geometry and will show you the simple workflow how to can how you can easily transform this geometry these b-wraps or sections in uh, to tecla geometry uh, so what would you are going to learn from this uh, master class uh, so first of all uh, it it is not to teach you everything about the tecla and sophistic we are going to make kind of uh, advanced stuff so it's uh, definitely uh, it's, we are not going to teach you the whole the basic of Tecla and Sophistic, but you will see the whole complete workflow. So you will see how to create this uh, bridge geometry uh, in Grasshopper with the use of the newest um, newest uh, components from Sophistic uh, Link, and afterwards you, you will see how to transfer uh, that with the live link to Tecla, and we were going to based. Uh, base our modeling on the real example. So this will be a pre-stressed concrete ridge about 120 meters. Uh, it will be free access. Uh, and this is uh, one of the examples um, of bridges in Norway. So this is a real structure, still is going to be uh, constructed and we are going to show you from the really basic how to, how to create uh, this structure. Uh, software that we are going to use. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use uh, Tecla 2022 educational version. Uh, I'm also using uh, Tecla educational version of LiveLink. So if you register your email in the Trimble account, you can um, easy download the Tecla version and together with the LiveLink completely for free. Andres, we're going to use Sophistic uh, 2023. And of course, we are going to use the, um, maybe the, not the latest because the eight is the latest, but uh, the most stable uh, version of Rhino 
which is right now seven. Chris, just one comment from my side. So yes. we are we're also using the Sophistic Rhino interface in 2023. So that's one one piece of software that we'll be missing there on the Sophistic side. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, that's right. When was the last uh, update? It was the it, it, it is also 2023. It's also 2023. Yeah, it's the same version as the main FEA software. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is the bridge that we are going to produce uh, for you. Uh, so we are going to get this uh, basic uh, geometry today. Uh, so today lesson, it will be everything about the geometry. Uh, and tomorrow on the second, uh, second session, also two hours in the same, uh, with the same schedule, uh, we are going to show uh, more advanced stuff. Uh, Andrew is going to uh, show you uh, the whole analysis uh, of this uh, of this model in Sophistic, and from my side, I'm going to show you how to model uh, pre-stress pre tendons together with the anchorage uh, reinforcement. We are going to make some uh, reinforcement of the part of the bridge deck, uh, which will be uh, a lot of fun, and we are going to maybe use also some components like railings and maybe some couplers. So we'll see how much time will be and how many questions you will have. Because every time uh, I'm following the chat, if you will have any questions, uh, feel free to comment, uh, whatever, if you are on the LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. We're going to put your uh, question on the on the screen, and we'll try to maybe show you some workflow uh, answer about how the that components works. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit for those who don't know me and don't know Andreas. So um, Andreas is a managing uh, director of Sophistic North America. I had the pleasure to conduct already webinar with Andreas already. For those who are interested to see the first uh, webinar that we had, it was about general, about using Sophistic uh, in uh, Grasshopper in uh, Sophistic. Andreas so uh, really lots of practical examples. Started with the simple examples like beam plates and afterwards showing uh, amazing towers and uh, stay cable bridges. So I really recommend go to YouTube channel Ren uh, Grasshopper to see this uh, recording, of course, after, after this uh, session to just know better about the connection. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is uh, Krzysztof Wojsław. Uh, you can just call me Chris. I'm a founder of a uh, platform, landgrasshopper.com. And my aim, main aim is to teach uh, engineers, mainly engineers, but we have more and more uh, architects uh, programming. And we start with the grasshopper, which we think uh, that is the easiest step to come into programming world. And actually, Grasshopper is coming more and more popular in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. So we have already 7,000 uh, uh, students registered for our mailing, uh, where we are uh, starting with the Grasshopper. In addition, I'm also an um, academic lecturer on the two uh, universities, one and the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and the Ziggurat uh, Global Institute, while I also have my lectures about, of course, Grasshopper and the newest technologies that we use to design structures. So this is basically uh, about me. Um, now the stage is yours, Andreas, so we can start with the your presentation, so you can start sharing your uh, sharing your screen. Uh, so we will uh, soon start. Let me see. I will check also some comments. Uh, I see if the recording will be emailed. Yes, recording will be when you emailed. Uh, if you register your uh, email, so you will get all the recordings. Chris, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. Uh, so if you can just make this presentation bigger, uh, full screen. Yeah, just uh, just one second. Okay. Yes. So I guess I guess we're ready to go. Yes, we are ready to go. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the introduction. So um, let's um, let's start with the sophistic part of the of this day one. Um, 
we're going to be talking about generating the geometry first. So if you remember from, from the last presentation we had together, this was one of my slides. I explained to you how the workflow looks like. So we have step one is creating some base geometry in, in Rhino and in Grasshopper. Step two would be to start adding structural properties to that base geometry. So you can start creating your, your anal analytical model of the bridge. And step three is using the Sophistic modules to translate that into language that Sophistic can understand and then be able to run that bridge model in the FEA software. So that's, that's the workflow. Today, we're really focusing on step one, creating that base geometry. Um, tomorrow, we'll talk about steps two and three. So the nice thing we're doing today is also this base geometry is not only being used for Sophistic and for steps two and three that you see here, it's also being used for Tecla. So I'm going to make that base geometry as accurate as possible and as, as, you know, as close to reality as possible so that Chris, who is the Tecla expert, can take that same geometry and work on his side of the of the project. So we're using really this concept of the single source of truth using some of these Sophistic components. I'm just going to scroll through some of these slides from, from last week. Just uh, bear with me a few seconds. Uh, just a small comment. You have this, uh, you are sharing your entire screen on the middle. Uh, if you can just click on the three dots uh, while sharing, so you can just hide it, uh, this uh, tab. This one? Yeah, this one. Uh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. So this is the bridge. This is this is what the end result looks like of what uh, I'm going to do today. I'm I'm gonna try to to do it from scratch. So I, it's not realistic to do it 100% from scratch. So I, I actually did prepare a few things. Um, the cross sections are already prepared, and I prepared a, an Excel spreadsheet that contains a bunch of information with stationing data and post tensioning information and alignment information and so on. So the the Rhino and the Grasshopper model will look pretty much empty, but these things are have been prepared in advance. This is going to be the step one of, of today. So we are going to define the alignment first. In the case of this bridge, the horizontal alignment is very simple. We only have one, one segment. Um, it's, it's an arc and it's a length of 125 meters approximately and has a radius of 3000 meters. So this is the, that first line in the Excel spreadsheet that you see on the left. Um, with our components, I would, I would be able to define a much more complex horizontal alignment just by adding lines to that Excel spreadsheet. You know, I, I could have an arc that transitions to a spiral, that transitions to a straight line, and so on. So that's, that's possible. In our case, it's very, very simple. Then we have the, the profile or the vertical alignment, which I took this information from some drawings. I think uh, Chris shared with me some, some information, and I was able to just take that from the drawings. So we have a bunch of stations. And we have a bunch of, of heights or, or elevations, and we have a, a radius of zero. So basically, pretty much, this is a this is a straight line uh, going upwards for the alignment, and we are starting at station ten thousand three hundred and forty. So roughly ten kilometers is is going to be the, the start station. So based on this first and second step, we can create our three D alignment in space, and then I can start uh, creating my my bridge model on top of that alignment. Of course, it's parametric, right? If I go back and change the, the horizontal alignment or the profile, everything should update and, and, uh, and stay consistent. The, the, the third step and the last step to the, to the axis definition in, uh, in our workflow is to define the so-called placements. And in Sophistic, these placements are points of interest along the axis. So uh, planes along the axis where something interesting is happening. And we can also assign names to these placements. So we can say, OK, we have station 0. And that's going to be our abutment 1. And it also has a type, a type S. That means this is going to be a support station. Then we have some joints and some, some diaphragms and some piers and the corresponding stations and their corresponding types. Um, basically, the, the reason we have these types is I can tell the program already, based on the, on the support stations, how many spans we have in our bridge. And later on, I can define some of some more data that uh, you know that that makes sense in this context. So, for example, if I have post tensioning, and I want to define my post tensioning tendons to have a low point at forty percent of span one, then I can do that because again, the program knows where my supports are and where my spans are, and it knows what forty percent of span one is. Okay. 
That's the alignment definition, the bridge axis definition. Then we have the cross-section definition. This, uh, this stuff I already prepared. And in this workflow, there are different ways to create the cross-sections. The one I'm using is I'm defining parametric cross-sections in a text file, in an external text file. And this text file is in JSON format, just so you know. So how does this work? You can see on the images to the right that there are some points with certain IDs. So for example, the top cross-section, this is my, my um, mid-span cross-section, right? And you can see that there are some points that have the ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this would be the, the slab portion of this, in this case, a composite section. And then we see the, the top part of this section with some other points with different IDs. So all of this information is defined in the JSON file. In the JSON file allows me to define the sections in a parametric way so that, for example, point 1 is going to have a coordinate uh, a Y and Z coordinate that depends on certain variables. So I can say, okay, point one is uh, minus W divided by two. So W is the width of my of my deck and the, the vertical coordinate is zero. And then for point 10, I would have the same horizontal coordinate and the vertical coordinate is the, the thickness um, of, the, of that cantilever and so on. So that's how I can build my, my cross sections. On the bottom, you would see the, the peer cross section with a, with a diaphragm so again, this is already prepared. I'm just going to use it in my workflow and I'm, I'll show you in a few seconds how that looks like. Just one, one thing to yeah. add uh, about the rotation of this bridge deck. Uh, can you tell a little bit more? Yeah, so we, we, we have a super elevation or a, or a cross fall in this bridge. And I'm going to be including that later on. So the, the cross section in this case is going to be flat or, or straight, no super elevation. But then when I connect it to the alignment, I'm able to add this, this X rotation, this local X rotation to the, to the superstructure. I'll, I'll get into those details a little bit later. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the transversal uh, slope of the deck. Uh, so it will be the whole cross section will uh, move, right? Uh, right. Rotate. Right. Are, so the, some, in some type of bridges, we have also this kind of slope that we have still uh, vertical uh, flanges. Right, mm -hmm. but in this case, we have that the whole uh, cross section is uh, rotating uh, in the middle uh, by the middle of the uh, of the center point. Yeah, definitely, and and uh, for that reason, it was easier for me to define that super elevation globally because the whole section is rotating. So I'm doing it on uh, later on on the on the placements level. And in the case that you mentioned earlier, where only the deck is is rotating in the and the webs are staying vertical, probably I would build that variable as, as a rotation within the cross section. But in this case, you know, we kept it simple. We don't have anything like that. Uh, but we have just uh, one more question from Bruno. Can we add mm -hmm. share cuts in JSON file? Share cuts? Uh, yes, it's possible. So you would have to go to the um, documentation. In the documentation for the, for the Rhino interface, there is a, a, a part about the JSON section. And there is an explanation of defining, you know, design relevant things like shear cuts or stress points, right? If you want to evaluate the stresses at a given cross section point along the bridge axis, a given construction stage, and so on. So, typical design feature, you would need to define that, that stress point, uh, and you can do that in the JSON file. Yeah, because Bruno has created a, a section in the Sophie Plus, then converted to JSON, and notice mm -hmm. that the custom shortcut information was not converted to JSON uh, from the Sophie Plus. Yeah, so it could be that this conversion step doesn't mm -hmm. have the the shortcuts, but if you do it natively within the JSON file, just go and look at our documentation. It should be possible. Yeah. If, if not, send me an email, and, and we'll we'll work it out. Yeah, Bruno already uh, answered that. Uh, he will look uh, take a look on the documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So once we once we define the axis, the bridge alignment, right, and we have our placements, uh, which are the important po uh, points along the the axis, um, we can use a a component that we have. It's very simple. It's called interpolate solid, and it will will simply do an extrusion of the cross section along the axis and, and give us our entire superstructure geometry. And the nice thing is we are, we, you know, we can 
have different cross sections along the axis. So in this case, you can see we have that mid span cross section and then over the piers, the cross section changes to the other one. And then again, we have the mid span section and then again, the pier section and so on. So we are able to incorporate break this into the workflow and um, and just sweep this, including those different sections in one go. So it's pretty quick to, to create something like this. And I can give this directly to Chris and he can then take it on to Tecla, which he'll show later on. But this is kind of the, the, the end result already for the superstructure geometry. So it's like making loft in Grasshopper between two sections, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't I don't know what um, the exact coding is behind the component. If if it's a, a loft that's happening, but it's something like that. So it's a, mm. either a sweep or a loft or or something mm. like that. Yeah. Okay. So once we have the superstructure completed, we are going to start working on the substructure. And for that, we again have some special sophisticated components that can help us. The one we are seeing here on the screen is called evaluate section. And what it does, it it gives us or it returns the the cross section at a specific station along the axis. So I can tell the program, give me the cross section at station 50, and it will show me that station, in this case, two stations. And I can also get a point. You remember those point IDs that I showed on the cross sectional level, those, those J, uh, from the JSON section? I can get any of those points at any position along the axis. And based on those points, I can, I can start building other stuff. In this case, I take the bottom center point of the section, and I can start building my substructure right at that position. So what we see here is basically we're doing the same thing we did for the superstructure. We had an axis and we had placements and so on. And we, and we extruded that into a superstructure. Here we have two vertical axes. And we also define placements for the vertical axis. So you can see here station 0, 5, 10, 15. These are measured in meters from the bottom of the cross section of the superstructure cross section all the way to the bottom. So uh, yeah, we have piers that are basically 25.5 uh, meters long. And we also have variables. And in this case, the variables are defining a change of a, of a given cross section variable along the length of the axis. So what do we have here? We have H. In this case, H is the height of the foundation. And we can see that at station 20, we are assigning that foundation an H value of uh, 1,200 millimeters. At, at station 20.35, so 35 centimeters lower, that increases dramatically to 7,600. And then at the final station, at station 21.5, we have that same constant value of, of 7,600. So that foundation is going to have that variability along that vertical axis. And yeah, this is hopefully going to make a lot more sense once we see it. Here are the sections I'm using for the substructure. So the, the top ones you see on the screen, they are the foundation. And the bottom ones are the pier cross section. Finally, we can, uh, you, we can use that interpolate solid component for the substructure as well. And in one go, we get those two piers with uh, their corresponding sections and also their corresponding section variability in the case of the foundation. And that's pretty much it. So the last step that I'll be discussing is post-tensioning. And we have here a couple of workflows that we can use. The one I'm explaining on the screen, hopefully, is, is uh, easy to understand. If I were to define these tendons from scratch myself, I would do something like this. I would use our component that is called PT geometry spline, because it, it interpolates a curve into a spline. It's going to need some stations, and it's going to need some offsets. So the stations that I'm using here, as you can see, they are actually relative stations and they are relative to the spans. So again, to the story I was telling you in the beginning, um, I don't have to use absolute station values. I can, but I don't have to. I have the option also to use relative station values. And this gives me the option to define my uh, post-tensioning um, high and low points based on percentages. So what I have here is at station zero, I have 0 0.3 meters offset from the axis. At 0 0.4, that means at 40% from span one, I have 1.5 meters. So that would be my low point at 40% of span one. Then I go to station one, which is you know, my, first, my first support or the end of span one. Um, again, I have 0 0.3 meters and so on. And this is a very quick and easy way to define 
my tendon profile in a parametric way. Finally, I'm using also some horizontal offsets that you can see here in the U input. And the horizontal offsets are 1.75 meters to the left and to the right. And I, because they are two tendons, right? I want, I, I actually want to graph that data, split it into two trees, right? So now we're talking about the data structures in Grasshopper. If I split those uh, horizontal offsets into two trees, then I can make sure that these station values and also the vertical values are applying to, to, to the two tendons. They're just uh, differentiated by different horizontal offsets. And finally, I'm using a pipe component to, to give that uh, those lines that I just created uh, a little diameter so I can, you know, so we can visually see it better. So that's pretty much the workflow we're going to be using today. And hopefully I can do this more or less from scratch in uh, something like 30 minutes. Let's see if, if uh, just one, que out. one question before, because we had a question from Ivan uh, mm -hmm. about uh, his question about what the tendons and what about like having variable sections along the alignment? Is it possible to define tendons geometry with the Z, Z coordinate depending on the height of the section along the alignment? Yeah, so if the if the section height changes like it would on a, for example, on a, on a uh, balanced cantilever yeah, uh, for example. type of bridge, then the tendons can also uh, follow. And uh, in that case, there's also some nice tricks we can do. So you can see here that the PT geometry spline component has an input option of a uh, section point right there. Hmm. So that means that if I want a tendon, for example, to follow the center of the soffit, right? And that soffit is varying. Um, I can simply say, I can simply define a cross section point in that soffit and that tendon will follow that cross section point. Or I can start defining now horizontal and vertical offsets from that cross section point inside the soffit. So there's different things we can do here uh, to make our, the workflow more efficient. Yeah, correct. Okay, so that's my, that's my presentation, my little introduction. Let's jump to the fun part. All right, so now stage is yours. Uh, so it will be live, uh, a live demonstration. Uh, so it will be uh, sophistic grasshopper. So for now, sorry, it will be just uh, just uh, just grasshopper with the sophistic components. Exactly. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen and stage is yours. Okay, so pretty much we have nothing in Rhino, right? So it, it, we have no preview right now. And you can see that my my canvas in Grasshopper has a few things, mostly the cross sections. And then I also prepared some text panels or, or some text scribbles so that I don't have to write anything while I'm explaining the workflow, just to save some time. So you can see here, we have the read section JSON component, which will read the, one of those JSON text files that includes all the, vari the, all the variables of my cross sections and so on. So this component is reading a file from my project folder and I'm connecting that component to a modify section component, which will show us all of the variables that are defined in that JSON file. Then I have the view section component that gives me a preview of that cross section. So I will switch the view to a side view just to show you the cross section and to show you that I can change, for example, any of these values pretty much you know, very, very, very quickly in real time and get some of these changes extremely fast. So I'll do that. I'll go back to the original section, but yeah, you can see it's a parametric section and it's very easy to change the, the variables here in Grasshopper. So that's my section admit span. Down here, I have the same thing and I'm viewing it, basically the two sections on top of each other, but this second one is my section over the peers. And what I did is I connected also the variables. So you can see that those um, sliders from the first section are being connected to the second section. So that again, they're moving together. If I change the height of the section, we see the changes happening on both. So uh, then what I'm doing is I am using a merge component to connect both of those sections. And I am using a list item component so that I can give the order of the sections that I'm going to place later on along the axis between the placements, okay? So I can take a panel and I can look at the output of the merge component. We can see our two cross sections. 
uh, they have indices zero and one. So zero would be my mid span section and one would be my peer section. And the next component, the list item component is just giving me that same thing, but multiple more times because I know I'm going to have a few placements along the axis and I'm going to want to place two times the mid span section. And then I'm going to want to place two times the, that uh, peer cross section and so on along the axis. So that's why I'm using that list item component. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it regarding the cross sections. I can start building now my road axis. So I'm going to take this scribble text from here and I'm going to go to the Sophistic panel and I'm going to use some axis geometry component and specifically the vertical alignment component, the horizontal alignment component and the alignment component, which is a collection of both. So let's start by connecting these horizontal alignment and vertical alignment. And I'm just going to start adding some information to these ones. So for the horizontal alignment, um, I want to be starting at station um, 10,339. Okay, so this will be my start station. I'll just connect that over there. The start point by default is 000, so the origin of Rhino. The start direction by default is in X direction in global X, so that will stay the same. And for the horizontal alignment, I also have a total length of 122.4 meters. And I'm also going to have a radius of 3,010.8 meters. Finally, I need to define that this is going to be an arc. So I just add another panel and I type in arc and I connect it to the horizontal alignment component. And that's it. So I can actually go to the 3D perspective view and we can already see there is something happening there. So there is a line that is slightly curved. If I click on the alignment component, it also gives me some dimension lines. Let me go to a quickly change to a top view. So it shows us the length of that arc segment, which is 122.4. So, okay, horizontal alignment is done. Let's move on to the vertical alignment. For this one, I'm going to be using a panel again, but in this case, a multi-line panel, because I want to define multiple stations and multiple H values. So I'll switch to my Excel, where I have some data collected. So for my vertical alignment, I'm simply going to copy these stations and paste them into my panel, just to be quick. So these are my stations. Let me copy this thing again and now take all of the heights. So these are all of the heights at those given stations. One more thing is if I scroll out, we don't really see our axis anymore. It's way up there, right? So I actually want to stay closer to the to the Rhino origin. And that's why that's why I'm going to use a base for my vertical alignment of um minus 150 meters, which pushes my alignment a little bit lower, just for, you know, for so can we, we can work a little easier. And that's it, that's the road axis. So we can continue and we can go ahead and define some placements. So if you remember, the placements are the important stations along the axis. We have some components that allows us to define the placement and I'm going to pick it up from the Sophistic tab and here we go. So again, I'm going to be needing some multi-line panel, multi-line data panels. And again, I'm going to be going to Excel and just copying some, from the, some data from here. So these are again, my superstructure placements. Let's take all of the names and copy them. So these are all my names and I'm taking all of the stations. By the way, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has questions while I do this. Uh, yeah, uh, so, the, so the names, it can be like your own defined names, right? Um, the names uh, are absolutely user defined. Yes, you're correct. So I so can write whatever can I be, want. Yeah, and can be in the different language even, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, so let it's me just more show for you. visualization. It's more for visualization. And I can also use the placement names later on if I want to you remember the evaluate section component that gives me a cross-section point at a given station. 
with that component, I can basically, you know, ask for station 50 meters, or I can start, or I can ask for station peer two, for example. So it, it also understands these labels when I'm hmm. trying to create geometry along the axis. So it's kind of variable, right? When we are speaking about like programming, so you can tell mm -hmm. that it's a variable, name of the variable. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have the alignment, including the placements, and we have the cross section. So now we're ready to create the superstructure. It's, uh, it's as easy as that. I'm going to the axis based modeling tab. Um, I'll be using the axis definition component, which is really the most important component and the central part of the workflow because it collects things like alignment and uh, it collects the cross sections, which I'm going to take from here um, already in their correct order, right? That, that I explained earlier. So I take that list item component for the cross sections. And I also will need the placements, which are coming from down here. I just defined them. And based on this information, alignment, cross section and placements, I can already make my extrusion. So I'll use the interpolate solid component, connect it. And uh, let's see what happened. Oh, I know there's a, actually a small mistake that I forgot. Okay, uh, it looks like we, we have some technical issue. I hope Anders will come back uh, uh, shortly. I think we had a lag. I think we maybe? had a lag. Uh, if you can just if you can just uh, come back and just repeat the last uh, last sentence. Yeah. So I was saying that um, here we are getting a. A small error so it's not interpolating and i i actually know what happened here so i actually made a small mistake our alignment it's is starting at station 10,000 10, meters but our placements are starting at zero so they are not corresponding to each other so i definitely need to go ahead and make sure that these stations are corresponding to this to these uh alignment stations right now they are not corresponding so what i'm going to do is take an addition component and I'm going to add this start station that I, that I use for the alignment, this 10,000 meters. And I'm going to add all of my placement stations and add this to the placement component. And now there, there is a bridge. So this is one step that I forgot. Um, I have to make sure that the stations are matching with the alignment stations, right? So that's yeah. that was missing. Yeah. Anyway, I can click on the access definition component and it will give me a preview of these panels and we can see, okay, the station is actually 10,339, that first station, which corresponds to this 10,339 10, value plus yeah. zero, essentially. Yeah, and then it has a question about that uh, because you, you, for now, this you, you show the workflow about the copying uh, this... Uh, uh, elevations and uh, information from the Excel, but actually you can also export it like with the, some components directly from the Excel, right? Yes, absolutely. There is a component here, read spreadsheet, which mm -hmm. saves us the time of taking all of these panels and, and um, copying the data from Excel manually and then adding it to the components. So I can use this component called read spreadsheet. Let me show you real quick. All I yeah. need is the, the name the name of the Excel file, I can put it into a panel. As long as it's in the same project folder, it's going to understand what's happening. So it, it uh, I also need to give it the sheet name, which in this case, it's called placements. So that's the sheet name. And as you can see, it gives me the names, stations, and types. And I can simply use that instead. So I can add that here stations over here and types over here and i can get rid of these panels oops that last one i didn't want to get rid of so here we go again stations and types yeah so this is probably the more elegant way to do it 
Yeah. It was also a question from the Fernando if you can link to the Excel. So so there is mm -hmm. a component already in this uh, in the plugin. Yes. So the other thing I like to do is I don't like when the wires are are moving like crazy from one step of the workflow to the other. So I like to use either faint wires or hidden values or hidden wires when they're coming from some other portion, right? So this is my this is my road access definition, which I like to keep separate. I usually like to group it. Here we have my placements, and this would be the, the superstructure geometry definition. Okay, so one more explanation. This solid is uh, is made out of B-reps, closed B-reps. So I can I can bake it and show it to you in Rhino what that looks like. So uh, I just did that. Let's move here to a wireframe view, maybe. And you can see I can you know I can grab the deck part of this composite section. I can pick up the tub part of the composite section. Here over the pier, we have the uh, the sections, including the diaphragms. Maybe switch it back to shaded. And you can see all of these individual pieces of sections that we are getting from that component, which I'm hoping they will be useful for you, Chris, once you start working in Tecla. Yeah, and actually, I love these B-Rubs because this is a really good quality mesh that I can uh, I can use afterwards. So we'll go uh, into uh, into that. We have some questions, uh, by the way. Yeah. Um, we had one uh, question from the Mehrans uh, Thompson uh, about uh, how we are going to deliver that to client. Uh, because they are great for designing and calculation, but does the client have to have this software in order to this beautiful work? So I can answer this uh, this question. So no, actually, this is everything in the how you can say in the background. So af afterwards, what we del delivering, we can just make an analysis and make a report. Here we are. This is the way the workflow how we can create. Uh, bridge deck geometry in the really smart way. Yeah, so in the end, the client will take either uh, either drawings, either two D drawings, or maybe if we if we're lucky, the IFC file. And then you know this is this is something that can be exported. So you can you can you can send this bridge, reinforce it in Tecla, and then export some section cuts and deliver some two D deliverables, some two D drawings or the IFC coming from Tecla. And the IFC is supposedly something you can open in any IFC viewer, which is, you know, you don't need an expensive software for that. Yeah, yeah, correct. OK, so one thing I forgot to add here is the super elevation, because we talked about this in the beginning. So if I go to the placements component, we can see here I'm able to actually rotate those planes in any direction, x, y, and z. The super elevation would be a rotation in x. So let me add a slider here with maybe three degrees. Um, one thing to note is the component understands radians, not degrees. So I need to convert degrees to radians. Luckily, we have a grasshopper component for that. So I'll just plug it in here, rotation X. And we can see how our, you know, our bridge section is rotating based on the super elevation that we are adding. Um, I am adding a, a global super elevation to the entire set of placements. If I wanted to add an individual super elevation for each placement, I could do that by adding a list. But in this case, it's just one value for everything. Keep things simple. OK. So the next thing I wanted to show you is how to create maybe some parapets. So for this, I actually also have a few cross sections that I prepared in advance. So if again, if I go to my side view, I created these cross sections already, and I put them here with some offsets in in, uh, in the YZ plane, so that I can put them visually in the correct position. And I'm going to be placing them also on the real geometry. So let me show you how I can do that. Of course, there's multiple ways to do things in Grasshopper. Um, I chose the following. I chose to just create them like if they were a new a new superstructure, a completely separate superstructure. So let me show you how I, how I would do that. We have a here an axis geometry component called offset curve. So I can take my main axis, my, my main bridge axis, and I can offset it in y direction. And I'm going to add two values here 
for the left parapet and for the right parapet. So I'm going to offset that curve in, in, uh, in Y by um, 4.625 and minus 4.625. Multi-line panel, right? So I added here to the variation in Y and we can see it here, the preview in, in, um, in Rhino, we can see that they are globally moved in Y. And I actually wanted a local movement in, in Y. So this is why I'm using this sophistic component called offset curve uh, and not simply a move curve, because I can add the placement information that I use for the main axis, and it will take all of the rotations and all of the information from that from the from the main axis. And in this case, the super elevation would be considered. Right, I just add the placements here, and then all of a sudden my curves are are put in place in the right position where I want them. So this what this is the first step offsetting those curves. Then I can simply use a new axis definition component and create a new extrusion. Um, I'm going to need the cross section, right? The parapet cross sections, which I already prepared. So let me take those from back there. And let's connect them. This wire, I'll make it hidden. As you can see, it's still not perfect because even though I rotated the insertion curves for the parapets, they are them, themselves, the section itself is also not rotated. So I need to also connect the placement component to the axis definition of the parapets themselves. So if I connect that placement definition here again, then I make sure they are perfectly in place and gives me the, the, the advantage also that the parapets will have the same divisions, right? The same subdivisions, we have the same placements. And if I bake those parapets, they are also just like the superstructure divided at the same stations as the rest of the, of the super. So that's what that last step did of adding the, the placements to the axis definition of the parapets. But it can be easily changed, right? If we don't want to have this division uh, by, yes. the, by the placements. It can be oh. done by the placements or it can be done here on the interpolate solid component. There's a lot of attributes we can do we can do and change. So there's one attribute. If I right click interpolation attributes, I can say do not split, right? And press OK. Can you, can, can you, can you zoom it when you are just showing this a little bit bigger screen? Uh, just yeah. to zoom in the canvas. There we go. Yeah. So I can do it either by right clicking on the component or we also have a component here, interpolation attributes, where I can add some properties such as split, yes or no. So that would go here and would be the same thing. So this <laughs> component, we, we made it available also with right click. So all of these options are that are in this uh, component are available on the right click? Yes. Okay. So for now I'll say yes, split, but again, you can change it if you want to. Mm -hmm. All right, that finishes the superstructure. Now let's move on to the substructure. So for the substructure, structure, as I showed you in the slides, I'll be using evaluate section that from the main axis, from the main bridge axis, I want to evaluate uh, the section at, the, at a given station. And I'm all, I also want to get a given cross section point. So right now we kind of get everything by default. We get all of the stations where we have a placement and we get the default point, which is the origin, the top center. So that's what we see here on the canvas. I want to um, break it down to only my peer stations and I could use a panel multi-line data, and I could explicitly list the stations where I have peers, or I can just list them by writing down peer. And um, let me just quickly check what those peers are called exactly. They are called peer two and peer three, I think. So let me go back to my panel and type in here, peer two and peer three. And if we add this to the evaluate section component to the station input, we get exactly those two peers. We, we retrieve those cross section points at those two peers, at those two locations. Alternatively, I can even make it faster and I can use a kind of like a joker command. I can type in peer star. And this gives me, it looks for every single placement and every single pl placement that has the word peer 
in them will be evaluated. So it kind of saves me a little bit of time. Is it also working with the question mark as we have it as uh, wild cards with another uh, type of variables in Grasshopper, like a question mark for the numbers if I or, or one letter or number, if I uh, remember correctly, wild mm -hmm. cards? Is it, it working the same way? No, it's not. But this okay. could be an interesting idea for future development. We just we just didn't come across this, but uh, we might consider it. Hmm. OK, so we have this, the peer stations. Now what I want to do is actually grab that point at the top of my cross section, and I want to copy it downwards. So I'm going to use a move command, a move component. And the translation vector that I want to move will be 0, 0, and minus 3.2. Sorry, 0, 0, minus 3.2. So I'm moving those points downwards by 3.2 meters. That is basically the height of the cross section plus 0 0.3 to give me a little bit of an offset uh, for my peer. So uh, let me just show you here. OK, so that was the original point. We moved it down by 3.2. Next, based on this point, I want to create my new axis for the substructure. So I'm going to use a line SDL component to define a line in z direction, right? That's the d input, so 0, 0, minus 1, because it's in negative z direction. And the length should be something like 30 meters. So I'm just using a slider with 30 meters, and that gives me my two vertical axes for the substructure. Can you change one option in Grasshopper and just show the full names of the inputs and outputs display and just full yes. names? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Maybe thanks. Will it will be it. just uh, visible for people that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So now that we have the axis, we can start creating, basically repeating the workflow and start creating placements for the substructure and also axis variables because we want that those uh, that foundation to change along the height of the foundation with the same cross section so let's uh, let's see how that works maybe let me take some some stuff from here we have the road axis just uh, trying to clean things up a little bit before moving on we have the placements down there let me move it down a little bit we have the superstructure geometric model right here and right now we're working on the substructure. So let's do it somewhere down there. Okay. In the meantime, that we have some. Bit... In the meantime, we had some questions from Ivan. Is the super L version affects also the bottom slab too? Uh, yeah, the whole the bridge deck is uh, is affected by the super elevation. Mm -hmm. In this case, yes, it is. But of course, you can do. Uh, you can do both. Uh, yes. If you would like to, don't want to uh, move and make super elevation of your bottom deck. So of course you can, uh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. So one thing that's important here, the, the substructure axes are simply two straight lines. And Grasshopper by default does the following. If I take a curved domain component, Grasshopper always thinks that any straight line has a domain from 0 to 1. And this is something that we don't want in our workflow because we want to be working with, with stations that are kind of global, right? So the, the length of this curve, the actual length is 30 meters. And I want the domain to go from 0 to 30. Otherwise, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the workflow will not work. So we're using a component here in between called reparameterized curve that we can use after any line definition, and this one will have a domain from 0 to 30. So this is just one step that we do here. It's kind of an, a, a little necessary step um, that we have to do in between. So this really finalizes our, our axis, our vertical axis. Now we can take the axis definition component, and we can start working on defining sections, variables, and placements. The sections are already done. I already have them prepared in advance. So these are my substructure cross-sections, which are my peer cross-section and my foundation cross-section. 
and they are already in the correct order. So basically, I'm going to have a few placements. Between the first two placements, I have section zero or index zero, which is my, my, uh, my peer section. And I repeat that four times. And at the end, I have my foundation cross section. We'll look at the, into this in detail soon. Let's just go ahead and add the sections to the access definition component. And now I can add the placements finally. So I'll take the placement by parameter component and I'm going to be needing some values. So again, I'm going to go back to my Excel and I'm going to take my substructure placements and copy them manually. So as you can see now, we see actually the planes of the, of the subdivisions, right? Of that, uh, of that, of those vertical axes. And actually, I think that's it. No, actually one thing is missing. Let's connect it to interpolate solid to see what we get so far. So we have the peers. Um, as you can see, again, we have one, two, three, four uh, segments that are peer sections. And then we have down there one segment that is the foundation section. The only thing I'm missing is the variability. Because if we zoom down here, I actually want this foundation to change along that little last length of the of the axis. So I'm going to take a component called variable distribution by points. The variable that I'm wanting to change is h. Let me prove it to you. If I go to the cross section definition, this is my this is my foundation cross section. There is exist a value for h. h is constant right now to five meters, right? I can change that, and you you can see it dynamically change in Rhino. But I actually want h to have a little bit different values than this five thousand. So we're going to replace that with something else. So let's go and call variable h to the panel, and let's start defining some values for h. So I'll take this and make it a multi-line panel. And I'm going back to my Excel to take the values for H. These are the stations, first of all. And I'll just make a copy and take my values. So at station 20, which is down here, right at the connection of the peer and the, and the foundation, I'm going to have a value of 1,200 millimeters. Then 35 millimeters low, uh, 35 centimeters lower, I have 7,600. And then right at the bottom at 21.5 meters, I have 7,600. So we, de we define the variable, but now we just need to connect it to the axis. And we see that change happening. And this finalizes the substructure geometric model. Again, I can, I can bake it and show it to you. So this is something Chris can hopefully use directly for his Tecla stuff. So we can see this is a nice and hollow uh, segment for the pier. And down here, we have also the nice geometry for our foundation. So here we have the rigid uh, connection, right? With the columns and the deck at the top. We left a gap. Right now we have a gap of 0 0.3. Mm -hmm. And in, in regards to the Sophistic model, we didn't you know, we didn't look at into that at all. This is for tomorrow. We, we will be creating the, the actual structural model for analysis. So this mm -hmm. is pure geometry. Okay, last step before we're done and I can hand over to you, Chris. I hope I'm, uh, I'm okay with time. No, we have really good time. We have some questions, so everything's okay. okay. Awesome, so let's just do this last step. It will be quick. Why is it, is it gonna be so quick? Because instead of doing what I showed you here in the PowerPoint, where we can, we are defining the tendons based on stations and offsets, um, I am cheating a little bit because I'm using a big spreadsheet that you gave me, Chris. So this is what the spreadsheet looks like. You can see a bunch of data, a huge amount of data. And processing this will be probably a nightmare, right? To, to process this and creating my tendons. Luckily, we have some good components that help us here. Let me show you how quick I can create all these tendons very, very fast with our components. What we need is, first of all, a component called TT Geometry Spline. 
So the same one I showed earlier in the slides. So what does this need? It needs the axis, the bridge main axis as an input. So I'm going to go and find that. It's right here. It also needs station values, horizontal offsets, and vertical offsets. That's the most important thing that I need right now. And this is exactly what is prepared here in the Excel. We have station values for tendon one. We have horizontal values for tendon one and vertical values for that same tendon. And this repeats for, for every tendon. So this is tendon geometry one, tendon geometry two, three, four, five, all the way to, I think, 12. So let's now use our Excel component. So in this case, it's going to really help us. The file path is the same one as I had earlier. So I'm just going to take that same panel with the name. The sheet name is, I know I called it PT. So let's just provide that sheet name. And OK, it says 10 geometry 1 because it's understanding this first line. I actually want to start reading here at A2. So this, the start point for, for the reading of the data is not A1. It's not cell A1, but A2. So let's add that info also. That's the cell start. And you can see it gave me a very big component with all of these stations and offsets for each and every one of those tendons. Now, we did something uh, quite nice here in the component. You can right click and you can say combine output with same name. So if the same name repeats like SUV, 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 and I click there, it's going to summarize this into, into like a much smaller component with the data structure that I already need for my further post-processing. So the data structure right here is a data with 12 branches and 601 items per branch. So each branch corresponds to each tendon and each item, uh, and all of these items are again, I have 601 items for that for that first uh, branch, for the second branch, and so on. So these are all the data points for each of the tendons. I love so, this. I love this future uh, about this uh, combining all the S and U and V uh, that, together. That's pretty. That's pretty nice, yeah. huh? Thanks, Chris. Okay, so let's see what it says. There's something missing here. Station S is outside of the bounds of the geometry. So I made the same error that I did earlier. Um, the, the stations are starting with zero here, but my actual bridge stations start with stations 10,000 and something. So I need to make sure I add that, that value. Um, so let's go back and take our original panel with the 10,339 meters and add all of those station values to that initial value. And that gives me all of my tendons all at once, very, very quickly. Finally, I like to put a pipe component just to be able to visualize the tendons a little bit better. And I can use a slider. I think, I think this value should be okay for the radius. And that's it. That is, that is the final step to our geometry. Mm, maybe one more small one. I prepared here some, some uh, colors, basically, to just organize the data with the colors. Chris, uh, I'm going to move, go back from the full names to the icon names, just because it looks a little more clean for now. That's OK. But uh, yeah, I want my superstructure to be green. I want my, sorry, blue, my substructure to be green and my tendons to be just full, full red. So I'm just going to connect those wires real quick. Let's take the the superstructure axis, connect it up there, and let's take the substructure axis and also connect it up there. And maybe the parapets, it also had its own axis. Let's connect it up there also for the colors. This I connected in the wrong place. And this one, yeah, I don't need this. I'm just going to connect it up there. Let's turn all of this stuff off. And this is the final model right here. OK, I guess I can take some questions, Chris. Great.
Great. Uh, the workflow was uh, amazing. And about like staying with the PT cable. So uh, Andres just showed like simplified, like uh, we had it from before uh, as UV uh, file with the station and uh, vert vertical and horizontal uh, distance from the center of the alignment. But there mm -hmm. are several ways of creating PT cables, right? With, with also uh, plugins available. Uh, in the uh, in this link, yeah. So we have here a, a few options. We have PT geometry from a curve. So from any random curve that you already have in Rhino, you can create a sophistic tendon. And we the one we use here is the PT geometry spline, which interpolates uh, into a spline based on some points. We also have the PT geometry straight, which is used for external PT or for pretensioning tendons normally. So there's there's a few options, and there's even another option. So we can we can use uh, cross-section points to create the, the tendons. So they don't have to be depending on the, on the axis and using some offsets. I can have, I can have a cross-section point that within the section is already varying based on variables along the axis. And then I can just extrude that cross-section point into a curve and then use that into as a tendon. This is usually, usually useful when I have inclined webs and I don't have to worry about that horizontal offset of manually calculating that for every station. I can just have a cross-section point that by definition moves in the middle of that web up and down. So that, that would be another option. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go to the question. We have already 14 questions. So let's start uh, with the first one. Uh, how do I set my road alignment DVG in Rhino with correct coordinates so that I will come correctly in Tecla? I can answer answer that. Uh, so mm -hmm. here we had the road alignment that we actually moved near Origo. Uh, so it will be easier for both uh, softwares, uh, Sophistic and uh, Tecla. And actually afterwards, we are using base point. Uh, by the base point, you can after export your geometry we are going to export our bridge into uh, global coordinates uh, by the use of the base point okay next uh, question how can we model a varying cross section with variable thickness which comes in between the end span and mid span cross section um, so yeah so defining the variable placement and vari def define your variables in the thickness of the cross section right yeah, so if we look at the cross section, there is a variable for the for the thickness. So let's see which one it is. T web, for example, or T bottom. I think this is the yeah the bottom slab thickness. Right now it's a constant five hundred, but um, instead of using that constant five hundred, I can again take the um, variable distribution by points component. So this is how I would do it. We need to name the variable. The name is bot so that, that's just the name of it and then we can define stations and we can define values for tbot and then you connect that to the axis to the main axis component and then you get that variability of of the of any variable along the axis hmm. okay and next question if you want to create a parametric section straight in grasshopper with sophistic components is there any limitations compared to using json or sophie plus yeah there are so there is a way to do it so the, the the easiest way maybe would be to draw something you can simply draw something in rhino let's say this is your cross section and you can use here a curve component to bring that. Oops, sorry, I misclicked. Set one curve. And then I need to use the boundary surface component. So if I have a B rep, I can use a sophisticated component called section from B rep. And this gives me a section I can use for sophistic for, for the workflow. This is the same as I did with the JSON, I can use it with this. In this, I can make parametric, right? So instead of drawing it in Rhino, I can just use Grasshopper uh, standard components to, to make it parametric so that the parametrics is not going to be an issue. What you're going to have an issue is with more advanced things like defining um, stress points or shear cuts and things like this. So th that is not supported currently with this option of uh, drawing it in Rhino. 
We might add something better in the future, but for, for the moment, probably the best way to define for a real project would be either JSON or, like you said, define it in Sophie Plus and then import it here into Grasshopper. For those of you that don't know, there is a read section from CDB component where you can define, you can draw the section in AutoCAD, define it in Sophie Plus. This is our AutoCAD plugin. And, and then based on, on the link to that database where that section is stored, you can bring it into Grasshopper and then use it in the workflow. So this would be another option. Do you have any maybe tutorials which can help to generate JSON file? This is a Patek question. There is, yeah. Go, uh, go to the to the documentation under Sophistic and help, and it will take you to the to the online documentation. There is a JSON section part, and there is a few examples with explanation there how to how to create that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here, Ivan, we already answered about the transaction vector placement play, global and local coordinates. So that it. Um, here, Arun, instead of manually inputting the height offset, can we can link the depth from the JSON data file? Yeah, absolutely. Here, for example, we have the variable um, or the slider for the gear depth, which is 2,900. So, you know, it's very easy. You can take a you can take that, that data, just kind of borrow it. And let's see where we did that offset. For that offset, we were using a translation and translational vector in Z, right? So we just provide that unit Z vector. And we're going to have to also add. So we're going to add 0 0.3 meters And to this, but this needs to be divided by 1000. So yeah, I'm just gonna do it like this. Here under A, Chris, do you know if it's possible to multiply that A input within the component? And uh, expression? Yeah, no, I was it's looking not, for that. It's no, not there, so I have to no, do it manually. There. I have to use division here. So I take this, I divide by 1000. And the result, I add 0 0.3, and I add it to the unit C vector, and then I connect it. So I think, let me just double check before I mess up my model. We have 0, 0, and 3.2. So I just need to make it negative, and then connect it. So this is the exact same thing. And now I'm, I'm taking that same input from earlier. Yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, we have next question. Um, can we use Grasshopper Sophistic to calculate pile groups? Uh, I will answer, of course. Uh, we can create uh, the whole workflow and we can calculate all the piles in the Sophistic as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, can you show how to add skew to the bridge? Uh, I, I think this is meant by the ends of the uh, of the bridge. Uh, not Not maybe for this one, but of course, you can rotate just the first section, right, in the placement. You can. So in the placement, I can rotate any 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 placement that I want. So if we're looking at the superstructure, you see all the planes. I can rotate any one of those to any angle that I want. But normally, that's also going to rotate my, my geometric model, which I probably don't want. So maybe one thing I can show you, if I want to make a skew for the peers only, Mm -hmm. is uh, for the peers, we also have uh, placements, which we can also rotate. So this one I can rotate in the X direction, and that will give me a, a skew for the peers. Let's, let's try that. So I'm going to need radians again. So this just rotated my, my peers. We can look here on the top view. Yeah, maybe not perspective view is better. So yeah, this is adding a skew to the to the substructure only, uh, but I can also do it on the on the superstructure level. Just it's just going to mess up some some of the other geometry that I did. Okay, uh, let's go. So yeah, hold the hold the even foundation can be skewed, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, Patrick, can you explain the logic behind the variables and station points where you can go down, uh, increase the thickness of the foundation? I think it was the question about this uh, variability. Yeah, here, this workflow about when you add this on the top of the foundation. Yeah, so if I turn on the panel, uh, the, sorry, the, the placements, you can see here the values. So right here, you see station 20, right at the beginning of the foundation. So basically what I'm saying is I am calling for station for for variable h which i know is the height of the foundation and i am calling for some stations 20 20.35 20 and 21.5 and i am replacing the original value of h with these values 1200 7600 and 7600 and i am connecting this now to my axis definition component and when i make the extrusion or the interpolation it contains all that information and it will consider that so I can, you know, I can change any of these. Let's say we want, uh, I don't know, 3000 at the start. So now it looks like this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, next question. Can we use this workflow for precast or just cast in place concrete? Uh, of course. Uh, we can use it for for both. And actually, you, you have designed right this kind of bridges in the US as a as a precast. Yeah, in the US, there's a lot of precast uh, segmental bridges, and yes, some of our clients are using our our workflows for for those bridges as well. Yeah. Uh, next uh, next question. Uh, some inputs are in meters, and others in millimeters. Uh, the software converts units automatically. Usually the cross sections are in millimeters. This is something that that's up to you. So I decided to define them in millimeters. In the JSON file, we can have we have that option, and we can see here if I highlight one of these, um, maybe this one. Yeah, the unit is not it's not showing, so I need a panel. So you can see here that the unit is millimeters for the sections. If I want to define it in meters, I can. And then for the rest of the structure, for the kind of the global model, it's always going to be the Rhino units, which in this case I set to meters. Uh, By the way, in Sophistic, we have a general way to control the units that is that can be saved to the to the Grasshopper file. So if I go to settings, I can set those units here globally uh, to metric or US customary. Yeah, and this is a really good question because in Tecla, we are also using for section millimeters mm -hmm. and Rhino uh, can transform uh, this from meters to millimeters on the road alignment. So I, I'm going to talk about uh, that. Uh, some few more questions. Can you use this component when the number of stations are different for different tendons? Uh, if some of the tendons are ending on the piers uh, axis instead of going to the end. If yes, then how? Uh, so here we, we had all the tendons uh, uh, defined in the Excel, and of course, if we are going to define this in the Excel, that this uh, that this tendon should start not going further than, for example, axis two. So actually, we can just uh, delete the, all the data. So mm -hmm. in this way, we're going to stop the tendons there. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, really, lots of qu qu comments about that. Was a parametric uh, that was a really great uh, masterclass. So really lots of uh, kudos, uh, really lots of uh, from Bruno, very nice masterclass. Thanks for sharing and convince this workflow is superior to Sophie Plus and class SSD. Uh, let me see more question. Uh, can you please briefly explain how to add blisters, external struts with known station points, also known to add discontinuous tendons connecting with blisters in between the spans? Yeah, I don't know if I can simply or quickly do that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really a, advanced stuff when, when it's, you're it's, going to move the, all the cables outside the, uh, the section. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there is there is different ways to do it. Like, you know that we have this component evaluate section that gives us a section point at any station along the axis. So that would be one way to at least get the section point where your blister starts. And then you can start creating it from that point on using kind of like a local coordinate system. So you can do it like that. Um, of course, if it's a, you, you can always kind of escape the workflow if, if the, let's say this part of the parametrics so far is was very easy to do. 
uh, you don't have to parameterize your entire model. Even like, for example, if I had an abutment here that is complicated, I probably will not parameterize it with Grasshopper. You can just go and, and draw it like you would in any CAD software. So some things are worth it to just draw manually. Um, Chris, would you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. It can do in the in the in the both ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know if blisters would be better to do it manually or with the workflow. I have done it in the past, so I have I have an example where I did it uh, parametrically. So it's definitely more yes. effort, but yeah, it's 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 it really depends. Work. It's it's really worth it when you have uh, if if you have the same blisters uh, with the same geometry with the same angles. I will not bother with uh, automate automatization, but we had some uh, with has of sac structure that every single blister was with the different geometry with the different angles and different reinforcement. Uh, so we had to actually actually find a way to optimize that. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's always it depends, but of course it's possible to optimize uh, optimize that. Um, let me see. Can we use? Um, okay, this was the question. Let me see. Is it possible to use this workflow to create a plate bridge with quad elements where the bridge has asymmetric skew ends and post tension cables? Additionally, is it possible to assign extra reinforcement locally? above a column, for example. Yeah, so I think the first question is related to the analysis model. If you want to mm -hmm. analyze it using quad elements. So yes, um, we can use this geometry that I created to create either a beam model or a shell model in Sophistic. We have different components that can help us get to that goal. So the first question, the first answer is yes, you can, you can, use, you can do a quad model from this uh, and send it to Sophistic. And the second one about the reinforcement, I don't know if this is related to more uh, Tecla side of things. Yeah, it will be more to about the Tecla, but, uh, about the reinforcement, but we are going to speak about the reinforcement uh, uh, to, uh, tomorrow on the uh, on the uh, day number two of this uh, masterclass. Uh, okay, let, let's three more questions and we are going to Tecla workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, is it impossible to define PT tendons as a series of functions which uh, specify discretization rather than a serious data points. Um, I don't sh I'm not sure I get that question. Uh, so it's more about like a function that is specified discretization. Uh, so it's more like a function, like the distance uh, mm -hmm. from the east section or... Um... So you want to use a function like... Uh... Yeah, like like just a math function that the, math parts like parable, that, like parable, or yeah, that, that describes the whole thing. I think you can do it with with native grasshopper. I'm pretty sure you can yeah. create a curve that follows a function, and then you can just connect that curve to our component called PT geometry curve. So it takes again that any any random curve, and then you can you can go on, go on in the workflow and define a sophistic tendon based on that. So yeah. I think yes, you can do it, but not with our not with a sophistic workflow, just with a standard grasshopper workflow. Yeah, and and speaking about that, uh, because this is what Andres uh, just showed us uh, today about this creating, you can actually create that everything in the pure grasshopper. But the advantage of that is that it's much more easier. Like I see that uh, here we have the lots of new plugins that actually create uh, you uh, really good quality V reps, and I really it's really hard actually to achieve that with the pure uh, grasshopper, especially if you are not experienced in the grass uh, grasshopper. Even I'm using grasshopper already five six years, and I already have some problems with the uh, B reps and meshes afterwards. But this uh, this plugin gives the really good uh, high quality B reps, which is really full advantage, and of course it's really user friendly. Uh, okay, two more uh, last question. Stages of construction is defined in Grasshopper on in Sophistic. So here Andres defined it in uh, Grasshopper, uh, but actually you can also define it in Sophistic. Okay. Yeah, uh, the stages. Usually when we are defining construction stages, we are using groups in Sophistic. So we're going to say, I want to activate group 10 at stage one and group 20 at stage two, right? So the, the, all of the structural elements go into a group. And then later on in SSD, in Sophistic, we, we define the construction sequence. So we need to make sure that we define those groups within this workflow. I'll talk about that tomorrow. 
but um, yeah, essentially we define the groups here and then the stages in Sophistic. It's kind of a two-step thing. Uh, and uh, great work on the student. Uh, do we have a student license for this softwares? You have a student's license for uh, for sure for Tecla and Tecla LiveLink. How is it with the Sophistic? Yeah, with Sophistic, it's free. So if you're a student, just go in and download the educational version of our software. You're going to have to provide proof of enrollment to a university. And if you have that, you can use our software for free. Is this is it the same with the plugin for Grasshopper? Yeah, it's the same. Okay, great. That's really amazing. Uh, that's a that's really good, good uh, information for the students that wants to maybe make a master uh, uh, with the use Grasshopper and uh, and Sophistic. Okay, uh, let's go to to the my part, which is a Tecla geometry part. Thank you, Andres. Uh, I will hide you in the in the background, but you are going to be there still. Uh, so if you uh, so you can all uh, you can still be there. <laughs> uh, I can also uh, follow uh, if you will have also some questions. I can also interrupt or write in the uh, in the in the chat. Okay, will do. Thanks, Chris. Okay, okay. So let's go to the Tecla geometry. So Andres prepared a really nice geometry. So now let's do go to jump into into Tecla. So first of all, uh, you will need to have, of course, Tecla uh, software, and uh, you will need also plugin for Tecla. And this is the thing that you always need to have installed the correct plugin to correct version of the Tecla that you are using. I'm here going to show you educational version of the uh, software that you can download, but you have to download also the educational version of the plugin to Grasshopper. So remember about that, if you're going to create a Trimble account, uh, so you will get this uh, two uh, licenses. So in the warehouse, if you have the maintenance mode, so you can download the Grasshopper Tecla uh, live link. And remember that this is a separate uh, live link if you are using Grasshopper Tecla Link Campus Edition. So it's an edu edu educational version that there is some limitation. Uh, if you are going to create this uh, Tecla file with this version, you will not uh, be able to open that in the standard, uh, standard uh, Trimble license. So when you are going to download the file, so there will be a plugin, which is looking like that. Uh, this is a typical Grasshopper link uh, file. So you will need to just copy that link uh, into your folder with components. Just a small rem reminder, you will always need to unblock uh, this uh, plugin, this Grasshopper Tecla Live link before uh, copying to your folder uh, because Windows sometimes is blocking and this is for security reasons. And after that, if you are going to unblock it, you can just go to component folders and just copy that. So you will get all these uh, components as, um, as Andres show it with Sophistic. So we will get also this one with the Tecla and the Tecla version that we have. And you can also test it if it's the link is uh, working. The Sebastian who created this link prepared this Tecla Grasshopper link example that you can load it. And actually, if you load it, this uh, structure is supposed to show up. But remember, always open Tecla first and then Rhino. And if it will be, you will open Rhino first and then Tecla. It will this connection will not work. So remember about that because this is the most common uh, mistake uh, in the uh, in the using the Grasshopper Live connection. Okay, so we talk about the scale. Uh, so here it's really important, uh, like Sophistic and Tecla, it's using the scale that is uh, used in Rhino. So every time when you are opening, uh, some of you will be asked for open a template file. So you he you here you are defining your global units, but you can always change it. But afterwards, uh, you can also change it in the unit settings on the. Uh, in the corner, I will show you shortly. They can click on the model units and get, go to change it. Uh, you can change it to millimeters on meters. We are going in this example, we are going to use meters because this is our alignment. But all the uh, dimensions for uh, section will be in millimeters. About uh, Remember also about absolute tolerances. 
because if you are going to change from example from meters to millimeters and you have like a huge absolute tolerance let's say 0 0.0001 so suddenly uh, your BRAPs created in uh, Grasshopper can crash. So remember that 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 sometimes like uh, absolute precision, it's not not better, but can actually destroy your model. Uh, while changing uh, these units in Tecla uh, or Rhino, always restart two programs. Uh, I think it's the same with uh, uh, with uh, Sophistic. But remember that every time when you are going to change uh, some units in Rhino, that will be scaled automatically. So save it, save your files, and open again Tecla and again Rhino because it's taking all the uh, all the units. And if you will ch change the units in Tecla, so remember that maybe you will need to change also some grids, grids like for example from meters to millimeters. All right. So afterwards, when we you will get uh, the live link installed, so first you will see that, for example, it will be like primitives. So in the same way that you are using in Grasshopper, some primitive elements like circles, curves, B wraps that Andres showed, or curves, that actually you can also the same types primitives in Tecla that are, are associated with this software. So you have Tecla line, Tecla point, you have beam components items. So actually, you can refer your existing Tecla model into the Grasshopper. So it's re about referring the existing uh, objects, even made manually in Tecla, into Grasshopper. You will get also a couple of uh, extra components. So here you will see all the steel elements and concrete elements. This connection is um, uh, developed every every year, every, even every, even every half of the year. So there is more and more components. Uh, so still there are some limitations. So for example, there is no still missing some uh, joints, missing some welds. But actually, you can do more and more. And actually, there is uh, this gap of this between what you can do manually in Tecla and what you can do Grasshopper is really, really small now. OK, so this uh, this is uh, this is what we are going to do uh, now. We are going to change the geometry that was created by Andres. And actually, uh, we are going to create BRAPs, like items. First, I will show you how to create the easiest way, how we can put it, uh, the fastest way, how to can put it in the in Tecla. But I will also show you how to create the cross sections. Uh, you will see some um, limitations about these two workflows and some advantages and adva disadvantages. So let's go uh, to, to our file. So I got it, I got from Andres, uh, the file that he he created. So let's say that we have already uh, our BRAP. So let's say that we have the BRAP that he he created. So let's say that we would like to show in the shaded um, geometry. So let's see. So it's a really nice BRAP that actually we can use. Let's open our Tecla that was open from before. We have the empty. Uh, empty screen so you will see there is nothing and the fastest way that we can actually use items uh, to export uh, our geometry so if we go to the tecla and we are going to use concrete and we go for the item so actually if we will grab this geometry that we got from andres so we will see that if we will see with the panel Okay, but we have really nice uh, structure of the data tree. So you will see that we have some uh, close B reps. We have in the data tree zero from the, for the uh, top deck and one for the lower deck. You will see here. And in the case we have three B reps, so we are in the most probably in the over the axis where we have also the middle section uh, with the with the doors. So actually, we have this B rep that we can already send to the to the Tecla. So this will be the easiest way. So let's connect that. So you will see we have some counter here, and voila, 
in this the easy really easy way we can get this really nice geometry so it's a full uh, geometry but it's defined as a item so this is a shape that is uh, always starts with the with the underscore and afterwards we have lots of um, uh, numbers and letters and this is a shape so this is I'm going to show you uh, some briefly what is the advantages and of uh, this disadvantages because not every time we would like to have uh, this shape because the shape you can see when you're going to click on that we can we cannot do it nothing with this shape you can see that we can highlight it it's a really nice geometry but actually we cannot even modify that uh, you can see if we're going to inquire some more information. So in this case, as I said, we got a really nice volume. We got uh, also the weight. So everything is perfect with that, with this uh, item. And basically, if you right click on the item, so you can uh, you can see some four options. So you can see four options for creating a mesh of this uh, B wrap. So this is the uh, um, Tecla is not um, taking, uh, thinking about like a B-Raps, like a, like a NURBS. Tecla always, whatever, what curve or what the b wrap you are going to um, send to Tecla, it will always send it to Mesh. And this is really important part that even if we are going to connect this b wrap so like a surface solid element, so still, this component will make it as a mesh. In this case, in Sophistic, we this is the BRAP, and this conversion works pretty pretty well. Uh, in some of the cases, we have to create a mesh before we are going to send. So first, we would like to first create a mesh, like here. We have just created a mesh based on this uh, solid element, and then send it to with the geometry. We can do it right now. You will see that nothing will change because there's uh, the same uh, the same options. But in really lots of cases that maybe we are, if we are not using Sophistic and uh, the method of creating the BRAP, so actually we need to have some setting, custom settings. This is more advanced stuff, but in the settings you can define how your mesh is defined. I will not going to talk about that, but you, uh, just for information, that if you are going to send some B wraps uh, into Tecla as an object, so actually you can in some in some cases you need to change this aspect ratios and minimum count of the meshes. Okay, so that's good. That's really looking good. But let's um, let's change a little bit uh, a little bit here. So for example, that in some cases like we maybe don't like that every face of this uh, Tecla model is in the same color. Maybe if the, it's, it's supposed to be different attributes. So let's maybe a little bit change the data tree structure that we have, like this is a, most probably this bridge will be built with the movable scaffolding system. So first this part will be built together, then the second part and then the third part. So let's create a, data tree structure that it will consist of three branches. So let's do it really, really quickly that actually we are going to um, use some param viewers uh, to viewer uh, to sort the data. So, okay. So with the split tree, uh, we can easily uh, choose our data trees. So let's say that we would like to have the first element. So with the list item, if I'm going to choose the right branch, so let's say that we are going to choose this branch, zero, semicolon, zero. So we are going to use as a mask. So we will get as a positive is our the last element. So let's uh, create the um, data tree. So if we're going to use Antwine component, and just to briefly just show you that we can just change the how, how uh, the data is structured. Okay, we have some data. Let's say copy this one and let's uh, select another branches 
let's say that we are going to split that, uh, split this list, and we are going to use uh, three elements. So I will just uh, change the uh, order of this um, data structure. So let's use uh, the negative uh, form and the positive from the mask. So we have next elements. Let's say that we have four elements and we have the, another one, which will be the mask B. All right. So if we had, we're going to connect. So we have the, the new structure. Let's say that we have some order, some order here and everything about that we have the now three branches. So let's say like param viewer. So now we have the, this construction phases. So in the first, we have two elements. So it will be bottom and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the top. We have the uh, second element uh, stage, which will be 10 elements. And the last, it will be 10 elements. So now let's, uh, let's create, well, let's use this component uh, as a data tree. So if you hover uh, over the geometry or every single component, so you will see that here we have geometry as a tree, line as a tree, we have a profile as a tree, and attributes as a tree. So let's create these attributes uh, based uh, on that. So let's say that I would like to create with the panel that this last segment will be, let's say, uh, class 30, the second will be 20, and the last 10. And every single uh, every single uh, stage, uh, elements in this stage will have, will have the same uh, the same color. So let's uh, create the multiple data. So we have this. And actually what we should do to obtain the attributes, because uh, when we are going to uh, connect attributes component, part attributes, so you will see that if we connect class and attributes, so you will see that actually will not get the right colors. So you will see that we just connected 30, 20, 10, and we just changed the attributes for this one is the first one, 30, 20, and all of the uh, all of the rest elements as the uh, normal uh, grasshopper um, connection will be with the short list. So it will be adjust just to that. So we have to create the li this list of the panel in the same branch structure, tree, tree data tree structure. Uh, as we have it in the, our input. So in this case, we would like to uh, repeat this data. So let's repeat this data that we have it, repeat function. And we're going to connect and we're going to graft because when we are going to graft, we are going to get the same structure. So we have three branches. So here we have the three branches and the length of course, it will be the same length as we have in this parent viewer. So if we go to three statistic here, so we're connecting, so we will have the length of each single data tree. So if we're going to graft it as well, so now we will get really nice structure in the same way uh, that we had it in the, our input. So we have two first elements will be 30 plus, next one will be 20, and the rest 10. So let's connect to that to the classes. Uh, here is the input as a uh, attribute as a data tree. And voila, we have everything in the different colors. So this is the way how we are going to operate with the different attributes, just with the use one component. And it's really beneficial to use just one component because, OK, we could explode that into different, uh, into different data trees. So for example, branch number one, uh, let's say that we are going to uh, explode that, uh, explode this, uh, this branch into three, okay? And actually we could create like three different uh, stages. So let's say that we had just, uh, just uh, one geometry. So let's say that we have this one geometry and as an attribute, part attribute, we have just 30, okay? So this is really 
a basic way of creating, uh, working with the attributes in Tecla. But I really, really recommend to start from the really beginning to work with the uh, data data trees. Okay, so we have the uh, we have our uh, bridge deck. Um, so let's go. Let's uh, let me see. Let's go to create some different uh, another elements. Okay, I will delete that. Now let's go to some parapets. Uh, we have on the right side, and again, we have from Andres, we have a BRAP. So let's use the same uh, principle. Uh, let's copy this uh, concrete element and just give uh, another geometry and to another class, maybe. Let's change it. So again, with the same way, you can see. And even if we are going to use the same data, because you will see that we can also create with the different colors. So even that, let's say that we would like to change the one parapet, one parapet on the right uh, right side with the another colors or with the another attributes. Let's say with the different faces uh, on the uh, sides or maybe profiles or names. So we can also create a data tree. So let's say that we would like to create in the same way. So we are going to copy this, uh, this part of the script. We are going to use the same data trees, but here now we are going to use just the two different names. So let's say parapet one and parapet two. So we have um, now attributes and you will see that this is a key that we have Again, the same structure of the data in the same way that we have as a, our input. So let's collect that uh, data to our names. And let's say, and if we go to our Tecla, so you will see that we have parapet one on the one side and the parapet two on the other side. So you can make a different combinations with them, uh, user defined attributes, but you will see that we are just using the one component. Okay, let's uh, make the last ones. Uh, so there will be a columns. Uh, so that's easy. Just connect this uh, to our uh, to our model. So we have some col columns that with the height that are already defined by uh, Andres. And we have also foundations. So let's connect that as well. Okay, and voila. So we have this all uh, all ge geometry on the same place. But as I said before, we have some limitation about the items. And now I will share my screen of the presentation. So here, this was the easiest and the fastest way uh, by creating the with the items. And this is, uh, we'll see what is the, the difference. So first of all, the items, you, you if you are just using items in Tecla, in some really um, difficult geometry, you can have problems with invalid meshes that can be not visible in the drawing. I have many problems with that, especially with the difficult ge geometry, even if we are going to smooth uh, this mess. So sometimes it can be really difficult to, uh, to see it in the drawings. Another uh, thing about using the native objects in Tecla and items is that it's really sometimes in some cases pro it's problematic to make a cuts and part cuts and cuts of the plane. Not in it's not working in every single case. So native objects are always more likable to get all the all the cuts and of course as in normal manual workflow you will have also some problems if the two cuts part cuts are going next to each other next problem as i showed you uh, in some cases when you're using items uh, in tecla uh, and grasshopper you will see that you will not get the the volume and the area uh, so you can see that on the right side, we have the really bad mesh that actually looks like a solid in um, in our Tecla model, but actually it's not showing the volume and the weight. So in some cases can be uh, really problematic. It really also corresponds that if the 
if this item is not visible on the drawing, so it's probably also not uh, having a volume. And as I said before, I really recommend to also, in the cases that you can create native objects, like a beam columns or path footings, so it's easier to modify because you have you can get this even control points. Even if you miss this uh, connection with the grasshopper, you're going to bag these elements. So actually, you can still modify that. You cannot, unfortunately, you cannot do so much with the items elements. So the conclusion is, if you can use Tecla native objects, so use these native objects. And now I will show you how to create the native uh, objects in in a grasshopper and tecla okay so let's go let's come back to our model uh, let's maybe start with the uh, with the deck uh, with the deck create creation so let's say that we have our uh, bridge curve okay so we have really nice bridge curve and we have bridge surface so this is the bridge safer that surface that was created by json file uh, by Andres, and from that bridge surfer, actually we can uh, create our profile in Tecla. So you can see this is on our uh, Z and Y plane. So let's uh, deconstruct that. Uh, let me see, let's go to surface and go to B-Wrap edges. So we will get the all naked um, uh, edges. So let's use the join function, join curves. So in this way, you will connect all these curves with the first profile on the top and on the bottom. So now you will see that we have data trees. So we're going to explode that. So in the first, uh, it will be the first element, the first profile, at the top, and one in the bottom. Okay. So now we can go to go to Tecla, and based on this curves, actually you can create our profile. So let's go to uh, let me see, it was in the extract. Let me see the profile, create profile. Create profile, you can find it in the attributes, okay? Attributes and create profile. So here, let's say that we are going to create uh, now, and this is a really good tip. Uh, this component sometimes can be really slow. So I, I, every time that I'm going to fill all the inputs, so as an outline, so outline frame, uh, of the cross section holes or origin. There's a center point where we following for the section and the name. I always uh, make a, a disable a sol solver. It's easier to just uh, create this profile. So we have our top element, let's say that is our outline. We have origin. So origin, let's say that will, will be aligned with our road line. So it will be the zero, zero point. So actually I'm going to create zero, zero point here in the middle. So it will be our origin and the name. This is, will be the name which will be visible in the profile in Tecla. So let's create deck, let's say top. Okay. And connect that the name and unlock our, uh, unlock our solver. So this component, it will be just pop up some, uh, some information about that this profile was created. So here with the panel, we can see that this deck top is the name of the profile. So now, based on that, uh, let's uh, create our bridge curve. So it will be our curve. So this is, you can see, this is our bridge curve in the middle. It's placed really nice and well. And let's create our profile, just connect this profile. And you will see that something is uh, something is wrong. And this is because of the rotation. If you remember, we had some rotation that actually were was defined in the uh, in the, defini the definition of the section. So here you can see that we have one, 1 1.72 as a, a, our a rotation. So let's uh, take this number from definition of the profile. And let's... Um, Let's uh, move a little bit this profile. Okay, let's uh, delete this profiles here. And let's go to our definition. Okay, so you can see that here is a top road line. 
but you will see that there is a gap and this is because of the position so we have our uh, um, rotation so let's use position of uh, uh, of our uh, component so if we're going to connect this position and we are going to the center line so you will see that we have the center but you will see that still it's not matching on the with the parapets so let's connect this number 1.72 to the component and you will see that we have created this nice deck and as andrea said we have this deck uh, divided by the sections uh, so here in every placement that was defined in the file we have the different section and of course uh, here i'm not have this option for the uh, poor uh, objects but if you go to um, menu and if you go to settings and advanced options and you will search for poor objects actually you can enable poor management and if you're going to do that and restart your tecla actually you can define your pores stages so if you are going to you can also define the poor stages uh, at the uh, at the this beam level so if you go to deformation i think uh, so deforming attributes and uh, no actually it's in the numbering so numbering attributes so actually here you can use the cast unit type if you right click on that so you will see that you can use the precast or casting place okay so we can define and you can define also the poor object so in the same way as in attributes you can see that we have nine uh, elements now so the data trees with the nine uh, nine branches so if we are going to define in the separate file uh, the different poor uh, attributes so actually we can combine all this concrete together so it will be nicer in the our ifc model okay so this is how we so we will we, this is how we create the native object if you double click so it will be desktop will be profile you can also rotate you can have some points here you can also define the number of points if you right click on that and that component so actually you can increase the number of points that actually is defined defined by this uh, the, this curve so actually let's say that we have three elements so every single now item is defined sorry uh, beam is defined by the three points if we're going to increase of course we're going to increase the quality of the curve and the bureau uh, and the item itself all right, so we have the deck with the native object. Uh, maybe let's uh, create another uh, another object. Let's say uh, parapets. So this is the cross section. Let's go for the parapet. Uh, I will uh, I will delete maybe this all the objects. Yes, and let's go and create the parapets in the same way. Okay. Just delete it. Okay, if we're going to use the to the parapets, so again we have the parapet curves. Again, extracted the same as Andres and used, so we can use just this curve and we have this surface. So we have left and the uh, and the right right parapet. So if we're going to use again the same workflow profile profile creation create profile. So again, lock the solver. So let's go to the outline. So we have uh, two of the uh, of the parapets. Let's define which of the origin it will need. We we're going to need. So let's explode that. Mm, explode the curve. So we need to first have a curves. So let's uh, extend that. So we have the surface. We have wrap edges so let's have this naked edges and explode that and now we will join the curves together just to shortly just to show the whole workflow and now we need to have the first uh, verticals which will be the origin and our name let's say parapet one and parapet two okay we are going to multiple uh, data and we are maybe also need to have the grafting 
because we have two elements in every single. So we have modify profile catalog here already uh, defined. So now uh, we are defining all the profiles. So let's wait a little, a little bit for the definition of the profiles. Okay, let me see. So I think that is creating too many uh, too many profiles. I think that I haven't connected the correct. This is the name. Okay, I'm really curious what will uh, happen uh, uh, right now, but just wait until that it will create the all the objects. So. Uh, in the meantime, I will just I will just show that in the this workflow and giving the all the attributes in the Tecla, it's really important about the data tree structures. So we can use uh, many different uh, components uh, about in uh, in Tecla uh, and Grasshopper workflow that create objects. But the best way and workflow, especially in the bridge creation, is that that you are going to use just the one object and with the several data items. Because first of all, it will be much faster. And second, you will have more control. But the thing is that you have to be good in the data tree structure, and it's not easy. So it took some, for me some uh, some years to master data trees. But if you will start from the day number one to go for the easy workflow with the data trees, uh, data trees uh, management. So actually, it will be much more easier. Uh, so this is was the workflow. So let's come back to our uh, uh, profiles. Actually, this is what I was thinking that it was too many, uh, too many um, objects that were created. Let's say that we will go to shift the data, shift the paths. We're going to look that. Okay, now it will be okay. Let's say now we have two points, we have two curves. Okay, let's create a new uh, parapet one and parapet two. And now, if I'm going to create this new two profiles, actually, it's going to overwrite uh, the new names. Okay, I have new profiles, and let's connect this parapet curve from the one. And let's connect to the profile. Okay. And we'll see that something is wrong. Okay. We have the previous parapets. Let's, uh, let's uh, delete them. Okay. You will see that we have these parapets like something is really wrong defined. And this is mainly because of, we can see that we have some gap between them. We forgot about the position uh, of this uh, parapet. So let's go to position and uh, set it for the center. Okay, it's looking good on this way, but another way you can see that there is something, something wrong. And this is probably because of the direction of the curve. So let's come back to mm, the, our parapet. So here is our, let's join these curves. Okay. And one of the curve we need to flip. Okay, so we are going to use the flip uh, curve for the first one. Uh, let me see. Oh no, it would be the most probably the second one. So we are going just to flip the one of the curves. So we are going to merge again. So that that's only second curve will be flipped. So let's connect to that, and you will see that we again have a native object which is called parapet two can go inside it and you will see that it's a native defined um, uh, profile, uh, which we can be uh, changed here with the height and width and so on. So it will be easier to operate. And as it was it before, here we can uh, have our number of points. So in the same way, we can create the native profiles of the columns and the foundations. So I, it's already 10 o'clock. I will just show you some two more components. Uh, let's go maybe to a foundation plane. So I will show you another workflow, how you can also create the, uh, mm -hmm. the foundations. So let's say that we would like to, based on this foundation, we would like to create the line. 
that actually is going through this direction. So let's that we are going to deconstruct this plane. So I will show you the last uh, the last workflow of create creation the elements, and we are going to move the point that is from the origin, and we are going to move in the y direction with the amplitude. So let's say that will be vector and the amplitude in the meters. So let's say five meters in the one direction here. Okay, so we have the one and let's, uh, and let's reverse the vector. So we have the two vectors. Okay, and let's uh, graph it. Okay, so we have two lines and let's, uh, let me see, I have two vectors and the four lines. Let me see. Okay, I have the one vector here and one vector here. Uh, okay. So now we are going to graph it as well. Okay, so now let's uh, interpolate data. Um, sorry, interpolate the curve. So actually, we are going to create our um, uh, our foundation. So you can see that here we have just created the axis, which is a perpendicular to the road alignment from the above side. And now let's uh, connect this curve to this. Mm, to our uh, path footing and let's maybe set position again by the middle so every time here we're going to maybe in the middle or in the top so you will see that we are creating really nice profile with this rcrw uh, profile with this uh, some uh, um, change, uh, some um, variables and actually they can be also defined that from the andreas uh, script if we would like to create, for example, some concrete layer under underneath, so let's uh, we can take these B-wraps as a object. So let's let's take these path fittings as a, an object. Okay, let's just maybe one only selected. So we have really nice B-wrap, and we can deconstruct it, a Tecla object to B-wrap. So we will get uh, two B-wraps in Rhino, and let's deconstruct that. Deconstruct wrap deconstruct and let's take some uh, the, the lower face so let's say which uh, object it will be it will be the the biggest object and based on that let's create a, a layer so let's say that it's our I don't know if it's going to change yes I'm going to change to the uh, to the contour. So you will see that we have some contour and as a basically layers, some concrete layers or under the foundation is are always a little bit wider. So let's a uh, little bit change the dimension of that. And for that, I can really recommend the, uh, the best plugin for uh, offsets. It's called Clipper. So poly offset offset. So here actually uh, the distance, let's say half of a meter, we can get uh, our contour and there is a uh, inside and outside the hole and we can define some uh, some uh, how it should be uh, ended it can be with the rounded form or will be the sharp like this and based on that we can connect this this our boundary so here we have really nice uh, layer with some thickness let's say here is a profile let's say 50 millimeters or maybe more 100 so based on that, so this is everything defined parametrically based on our shape. So every time when we are going to change the elevation of the height of the column, so this will be changed. So and of course we created in the both of the uh, both of the columns with the data trees. We have two of them. So now we have created this bridge geometry. Let's come back to that and and let's recreate that so we have all our bridge geometry that we were creating today. So this is the basically uh, the easiest way of creating um, creating the uh, the objects. Uh, tomorrow, uh, after Andrea's first session of showing uh, analytical models, I'm going to create the tendons based on the uh, geometry provided by Andreas and some uh, reinforcement uh, to together um, 
together with components, maybe some barriers, maybe some anchorage. So we will see uh, how it will be. Now let's go. I don't know if there's some questions about the Tecla and uh, Grasshopper. Let's see. Okay, uh, Rone, uh, Rone, hi Chris. How we can create a concrete hollow section for the pylons? So here that uh, actually, if we come back to the script from Andres, let's see parapet section, we have tendons and we have substructure. So here we have the foundation and we have a pier. So let's take a look what we have prepared here. So again, if we're going to JSON file, I'm going to add uh, add you, Andreas, to the to the last. Uh, if there's any questions, so you are mm -hmm. uh, with us. So here, Andreas uh, created the hollow uh, hollow section defined with this attribute. So the height, bottom, and the thickness, uh, and so on. So this is the one way. And of course, you can based on these wraps that was created, we can also create a native profile in uh, in Tecla. And more questions. So in Rhino, the model is in meters and in Tecla in millimeters. No need to multiply by 1000. No, in this case, uh, not, not because uh, also Andrews defined the older section by millimeters. So that's why we do not have to define it. Uh, Tobias, really impressive still skill, Chris. Thanks. Just watch the part uh, with the white smile on face. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Tobias. Valentinas, thank you for the effort and explain the complex thing. Hope in three years to understand what you said today. Uh, no, actually, it's not need for five years. Um, we have maybe you, you have maybe more of the experience with Grasshopper. We are about six years. Are you, Andreas, work using Grasshopper? Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. But actually, to use that, you don't need to uh, Valentinas to use the six years. Uh, of course, it's not that easiest way uh, to learn Grasshopper, especially data trees and the workflow. Uh, but uh, but the thing is that with this all the components that already someone else created, you don't have to uh, you don't have to create and uh, reinvent the wheel uh, again. So this is really really helpful. Uh, to be to to be honest, uh, I've been using for this kind of bridges all the. A manual work in a, a kind of manual, if you can say, in Grasshopper, but it's still possible to do that. Uh, so this is the easiest way maybe to learn if you have already this component and will take some, uh, maybe not years, but months to learn that. Okay. Um, I think it's we are out of the time already. Uh, there was... Um, Great to workflow. Sorry for a uh, little bit by extending, and we are going to invite you for uh, tomorrow uh, tomorrow session. So remember the same time uh, in your country you will get uh, the link uh, for the with the invitation for tomorrow. Uh, you will get it if you re register, and uh, for now it's here. Uh, I can um, I can maybe uh, if you haven't answered some question I will write down them and maybe we are going to answer uh, on the tomorrow session. Do you have something to add, Andres? No, I don't think so. I think um, we are a little bit of, over time, so I, I guess we can leave it here. Yeah, and yeah, great to have you, Jakob, here. Uh, good to have Jakob from Sweden. Uh, greetings from uh, from Oslo. And for those who want to uh, download the guide for Grasshopper in Tecla, how to start, so I recommend, I, I have prepared, prepared, prepared a document which you can just uh, easily go and follow step by step, like installation process, how to deal with some uh, installation of the plugins and how to make some um, base point and movement of the structure. So I would recommend for those who wants to start already tomorrow, so start with documents. So that was uh, from us. It was a pleasure to have all of you. And yeah, that's it. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Chris. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.